Hello folks, hope things are going well with you, Hope you hopefully you're having a good part of your week. Let's dive into some hobby nightmares, shall we? If you like what I do, the subscribe button is down below, as is the Patreon if you want to buy me a beer towards the weekend. I am having quite a stressful week at work and in other places, so that would be grand, thank you very much. If you can sustain my recent alcohol, alcohol habit, I'm joking, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm okay, I'm just saying, I like beer. Let's move on, shall we, and get out of my habits towards our hobby nightmares. And the first one today comes from somebody called Snow. And he says, Greetings. Call me Snow. I have done. I waited to tell you about my hobby nightmare. As bad as it was, I feel like I got the last laugh. So here goes. All right, I'll be ju the judge of that. It starts just before the pandemic, as a man just turning 40. I happened to live practically across the street from a Warhammer store. One day, while shopping and walking, I decided to pop into the Games Workshop store on the corner just to check it out. I had no clue what the shop was about when I first walked in. I had a vague idea that it was a game, but had never really been around any Warhammer fans. I do, however, consider myself a gamer. I love sci-fi, and as a kid, I loved assembling plastic models. Mostly sports cars and fighter jets. Mate, you're our target audience, is what you are. So it goes without saying that 40k really ticked a lot of boxes for me. That day, I bought a box of three push-fit Space Marines with the paint and clippers included. Great set. I sat down in the shop and painted one of my new Marines, whilst the shopkeeper gave me an intro to the gaming side of 40k. He told me about characters versus elites and so forth. That's fair enough. And how these little plastic army men can shoot each other via dice rolls. I was hooked. I soon bought a box of ta the tactical squad and quickly had them assembled wearing the proper uniform of the day. I'm guessing that's ultramarines, right? Then I bought the first strike starter set and then the no no fear starter set. I had about 750 to 1000 points. Enough to start playing a friendly game. I just needed an opponent but gaming in store was shut down at the time, and no one I knew had ever even heard of Warhammer. Being in the pandemic, games in store were not allowed. I wanted to find an opponent to battle until, until the blight passed, and in-store gaming resumed. But now, I had the core book and my codex. I spent hours reading, learning and planning how I would play this game, if I could only just find an opponent to practice with. Enter the Nightmare. We'll call him Dolt, because it's not his name, but it kind of sounds like it. Dolt was my apartment complex neighbour. He was an okay guy, a bit neurotic and a total gamer. Dolt will be a perfect opponent in 40k, I thought. He had seen my models and took quite an interest in these figures themselves. Himself, sorry. He was a big fan of computer RPG and turn-based strategy games. He wanted to play, and I had him on the hook. I convinced him to start an army... And to fight me. Alright. As Dalt and I walked to Games Workshop down the street, I told him more and more about what I knew of the other factions. Long story short, Dalt picked out a start collecting box of the Tau, and soon picked up a Fire Warrior and Pathfinder box. He reluctantly bought the Tau Codex, but refused to ever buy or even read the core rulebook, a point that will become very functional in the story ahead. What? He doesn't want to read the core rulebook. I understand not wanting to buy it. It's 30-odd 30, 30 quid. But not reading it? It's a bit odd. I felt as if my study of the core rules was enough to get us through a game. You're wrong, mate. You both need to know the rules. Plus, we would always pass the book back and forth. No need to spend the money twice on the same book, right? A week or two passes. Dolt has his models assembled and we are ready to play. I had no official terrain to speak of, so for our first battle, we used what we would come to cr to create uh, line of sight blockers and other terrain features from things about the house. Over the next few months, Dalt and I get uh, get in a game almost every weekend. Soon, a pattern develops. I am the person with the core rulebook. I am the person explaining the rules and setting the pace of the game, so to speak. I would have to start saying things like, 
Now for your movement phase, and I quote, now for your movement phase, then shooting, collect victory points for secondaries, etc. Unquote. Dalt was very smart and picked up the rules quite quickly. He was also, however, a whiny little bitch and a poor loser. I had to listen to him cry about how unfair it was that I can shoot his battle suit when I can only see the antenna. He wanted to break off the antenna for a game advantage. I, I, do you know what, mate? I, I, as much as he's being whiny here, I get what he's saying. I get what he's saying. Um, there should be a percentage of the model that you need to see, but then again, that's, that's, that's a huge grey area where people will try and take the piss, do you know what I mean? So, for me, it has to be, you know, um, if you're, if you, if part of the model's behind terrain, it gets a cover save, but you can shoot it, right? It gets a, it gets a cover save, but you can shoot it. Three cover saves will be good. So, if you got like, um, a guaranteed four plus for like normal, a three plus for, for heavy, and a, and a two plus for really heavy, you know, and, and maybe make sure that the cover save can't be, so if he's in like, if you can only see the antenna of a Tau battle suit or something, the the two plus save never gets worse. Do you know what I'm saying? So so like um, armor piercing doesn't do anything if you if you can only see like the antenna. That would be a good rule to bring into the game. Is like just to say, look, you know, if if you can only see like a a, a tiny piece of the model, then you can't. You know, you, the two plus never moves from the cover save. I don't know how we'd work that out. But I think that's a good way of getting around it. But I just hate that rule. I hate the rule. You can see my finger, so you can kill me. Okay, fine. Whatever. You can see my sword, so you can kill me. Dude, come on. He would especially cry that Space Marine Ballistic Skill is a 3+, plus versus a Tau 4+. Plus. One, but has he ever heard of Marker Lights? Marker Lights sort all that out. You, know, you just got to use your army better. Once, when I set a Marine unit behind a closed door for cover... He actually cried until I acquiesced that yes, since you can see the tiny silver of the marine through the tiny sliver of the marine through the homemade terrain with it with a closed but cracked door, you can in fact shoot me through the closed door. Good shot, asshole. But again, this is a this is tit for tat between mates. Do you know what I mean? Because technically he's right. If you can shoot his antenna, right, he can shoot you through a door where he can see you through a door. Do you know what I mean? If you can see a sliver of your model through a door, he's going tip a tat here, mate. You shot his antenna, and that's it. So now he's saying, okay, well, I can see you through that door. You know what I mean? Fair enough, as far as I'm concerned. Not only was he a whiner, but north. This man was so slow. Literally an hour plus for the movement phase. Okay, that's ridiculous. Then another 30 minutes for shooting. A game with this guy took six or even eight hours. The whole time, he would just cry about how good ultramarines are, and how Tau are so weak and helpless, and they don't stand a chance. Boo hoo hoo. He also scoured eBay for metal Tau broadsides and such, because they were so much smaller than the plastic ones. Models for advantage, if you know what I mean. Yeah, okay, th yeah, this guy does seem like he's, he's, he's well into win winning, if you know what I mean. That's all he wants to do. I almost forgot to mention, neither he or I knew how Tau shield drones and Savior protocol worked. So let's just say he was throwing a save throw at least twice and sometimes three times for every engagement. I basically let him get away with these shenanigans because I really just wanted to play the bloody game. We played lots of games together that first year of the pandemic. Most all 500 point affairs. Eventually, I think, we each put, put out 1,500 points on the field as our biggest ever 40k game. Every game was filled with arguing. Every movement or action seemed to require debate and haggling. The worst part of it was Dolt would argue the rules with me as if he knew them somehow. Dolt, the guy who never once so much as had a cup of coffee with the core rulebook, would argue with me, a nerd who literally slept with the core rulebook the first few weeks that I owned it. Nothing weird, I just fall asleep, fall asleep whilst reading. We've all been there, dude, don't worry. Maybe we've all read a, uh, a, uh, was it one of the horror heresy books. If you've read Nemesis, mate, you're going to be falling asleep quite a lot. Um, you know, and Mortis, too. Oh, my God. I grew spectacularly tired of telling him his made-up rule was, in fact, made up and not in the book. And this would make him cry. I think if Dalton and I played 10 games of 40k the, that year, he must have won 8 of them. His crying was his superpower, and my apathy was my downfall. 
he won by sheer will to whine about every game decision. If things were not totally slanted in his favour, then it was unfair, in his opinion. I couldn't take it anymore. I still wanted to play, I wanted to beat him, but I just did, could not bother with a six-hour game adult. Well, I think that the pandemic has a lot to say about this, you know what I mean? I think if you have any other option, then you will go away and generally find another opponent. Do you know what I mean? I think if you've got any option, that's what you're going to do. You're going to go away and find another opponent. The pandemic has done for that, unfortunately, which is a bit, a bit crappy, but it is what it is. Then I got an idea. Well, Games Workshop gave me an idea by releasing the first Kill Team starter box. Ah, I see, I see. Right, are you going to uh, find a workaround here? Or you could do, needless to say, you could do something akin to uh, one-page rules. Let's see what you do. Let's see what you do. When the first starter box of Kill Team was available on the shelves, I picked it up right away. It contained Space Marine Reavers versus Tau, plus some terrain. I bought that sucker and got to work. Dude, yeah, Space Marine Reavers against Tau, it's right up your street, right? Literally what you're doing, that's awesome. Fantastic stuff. I bought that sucker and got to work. I introduced Kill Team to Dolt as a quick pace smaller game we could play in less time than the big 40k games. Awesome, 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 let's move on. Back then, Kill Team Mechanics were very similar to 40k, so the learning curve was pretty shallow. I adopted my new Tau Kill Team and Dolt hit up eBay to source his new Kill Team of choice, the Tyranids. Dude, he's got Tau right there. What is going on? <laughs> he's literally got Tau right there. Alright, 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 whatever, whatever. He found a bunch of Gaunts, a Lictor and other bugs already painted pretty poorly. We began playing Kill Team regularly and got the hang of it fairly quickly. He would still cry about every misfortune and misstep, but with fewer models and rules, Kill Team was much more bearable with Dolt. Now, I wish I could say my revenge was planned, but in fact it was just a happy accident. Once we were comfortable with the mechanics of Kill Team, him with his nids and me with the Tau, we decided to start a campaign of Kill Team. The campaign would break the gamer in Dolt. As you know, campaigns can be very rewarding. Not just are they fun, but one can accumulate stats, abilities and bragging rights over the course of a campaign. The yin to this yang is the fact that during a campaign a model can actually be killed. Like killed for the whole campaign and not just that one game. If that model is killed during the campaign, all accumulated stats are lost with it. Killed and gone forever. Yeah, kind of like um, XCOM. I don't remember the first one or two missions of the campaign very well. Dolt cried. I remember that though. By the third mission, we had agreed before the match that we, we would be following the mechanic for campaign death. If a model died during the course of the normal match, a post-match dice roll determined that model's fate for the rest of the campaign. By this time, my Tau and Dolt's nids had accumulated a few stats and began to take on a personality, as game pieces are wont to do. I was quite tired of Dolt as a competitor, and what happened next can only be praised by the dice gods. But what I will say is, is if you're getting a mechanic like this where people are accumulating XP, um, it only works as a, as a mechanic if one or two of those people die. So there are stakes, so they're actual living people, do you know what I mean? If, there, if there's no danger in these people dying, then you may as well not give them XP. If you know what I'm saying. Anyway. In the third mission, we pulled a scenario that basically puts both teams deploying on a narrow band at the very back opposite ends of the short edge of the board. The objective, receive two victory points for every model of yours you can successfully run off the back of the opponent's side of the board. Or, and, receive one victory point for each opponent's model destroyed. Okay, so you're essentially playing dodgeball with bullets. We deploy and Dolt cries. Dolt has first turn and has four to five more models, with the Nids on his, uh, on his team than my Tau. I can see it from, the, from before the first dice roll. Dolt wants to bring the swarm. His plan, run all these bugs at me and see how many it, 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 and see how 
many make it to the promised land off the back of my deployment zone. He thinks I will do the same. That's a bad strategy, dude. He's going to kill all your gaunts and get all those victory points. Turn 1. He moves his first a few fast-moving bugs to get at least halfway across the board in a mad bug dash, leaving his slower, heavier bugs in the back, waiting to lay down the firepower. Not a bad strategy, if that's what he's going to do. While still pushing forwards in an effort to run straight through my deployment zone. My turn 1, I have a plan. I want to fake a dash forward, as if I'm planning to run all my models off the back of his board. I bring forward the tower breaches to a perfect position to blast his closest bugs. I leave a couple of rail gunners in the back. I manage an extremely effective fire phase, removing each of the three bugs that I shot. Not only did this remove his models for the game, but it gave my first line much needed space, because Dolt had another four to five bugs closely behind the first. In Dolt's turn two, he continued the rapid advance strategy. He does not even bother charging into melee with my Tau, as his objective is to run off the back of the board as quickly as possible. No time to fist fight a fish person for these nids. Well, again, he's playing it like a video gamer, man. He's trying to min-max his, his strategy and it's not working. It's going gonna, it's gonna to smack him right in the face, I'm telling you. By now, his entire kill team was at least halfway across the board. The math said, even if he can only manage to get half of his bugs to the promised land, he will accumulate many more points much sooner than if I got my whole team to his promised land. I could see, by his cocky smile, Dalt thought this game was in the bag. Then came my turn two. In turn one, I had also moved as many models as forward as I could. This brought my guns in range, and I put both armies near the middle of the boards. In turn two, I take all of my models as far back as I can to stand sentry on the back of the board. I figure... If I give myself some space, I can use the tower firepower to blast the bugs off the board and deny him the victory points of reaching the promised land. I move all my models as far back as I can. The look on Dalt's face when I moved my guns back was, you know, you're not going to try and run off the board. Sorry, you're not going to try and run off the board, he asked. Ready to cry? No. I figure I can gain more VP by killing your team and not even attempting to escape the back of your zone. I'm going to defend this space, I think, said I. And I did. The towel gun was sat back and popped just about every single bug he had. I mean every single bug that had accumulated a couple of games worth of stats was popped and off the board. I won on, Bob, um, on bug popping VP alone. He was completely shocked, outgunned and outplayed. He did not get a single bug to the promised land. Then comes the post-game death roll. It was time to see if our brave warriors would live to fight another day, or if this was their final campaign battle. Another long story short, the dice gods popped, pooped, all over his nids. He failed 6-7 to seven out of the 10 rolls. His entire front line of gaunts, dead. His precious lictor leader, with earned stats, dead. That means those models and their accumulated stats were out of the campaign for good. That also means in game 4, he would be fielding mostly rookie bugs against my now even more hardened Tau. He was so sad he could not see the point of playing anymore, kill team with, stat with statless models. So, my third game of kill team was my final game ever with Dolt. Even though he was my neighbour, after that we never talked much ever again. He stopped playing War we stopped playing Warhammer together uh, after that. I offered to buy all of his models from him before he moved back to the East Coast. He said okay, but then moved without ever making the exchange. I later texted him saying that I hoped his models broke in transit to the East Coast and that he was the worst opponent ever. I never heard back from Dalt. Thanks. Um okay. This is gonna sound really 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 not harsh but like you know um i don't know i think you're both as bad as each other here okay his whinging yes all right yeah I, I get you man like that that's horrible you know um but i can understand how he feels about you know the the, the lack of um about losing that last game because not only has he lost the game badly with, with a bad tactical decision but the mission you've picked there is essentially made for you winning that game. 
He's got he's got more models for you to kill, and more shrapnel uh, sh uh, chaff for you to chew through. Right? It basically favors small elite kill teams. When when you know you get loads of victory points for killing a, a model of your opponent, you know the, the the likelihood of him getting to your side of the field is very 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 low. And uh, so I can understand what he what, why he was upset, but his reaction again way overboard, not needed. Okay. A lot of this can be solved with just a, a conversation. And in your petty actions towards the end there don't stand you in good stead for, for to be in good standing in the in the hobby community. Don't do that. All right? Offer to buy his models, fine, no problem. But again, if he's already salty with the fact that he started this hobby, right? And it was nothing but a stress to him, and he thinks that you've done him wrong, and then you offer to buy his models, that's like you're kicking him when he's down. Do you know what I mean? Like... I, and then he moves. Okay, fine. He should have texted you. Fine. But just leave it alone. There's no need to text him saying, I hope your model's break in transit. There's no need for that, dude. Just step off it. Life's full enough of stress as it is by introducing some more to your own life. Speaking of stress, let's get into Clive and his worst ever day as a Games Workshop manager. Um, so, Clive says... Hi North, it's Clive here from the Discord. It was nice to speak to you this week. Yeah, you too, man. It was a nice call. Thank you very much. And thank you for sending this in. So, as you know, but your audience don't know, I worked at Games Workshop for several years. And my first week at Games Workshop was easily the worst I ever had as part of the company. I had gotten my job as a wide-eyed new person straight off the street. I'd worked in H&M for a while, and also in HMV as a general sales body, so I knew how to talk people up into sales, even of expensive products, which stood me in good stead because I loved the hobby, loved everything about it, and I finally managed to get myself my own store. This is relatively rare, as I know you've said in the past, because people off the street don't normally get given their own stores, but here we are. Yeah, the only guy I ever knew at Games Workshop, this is North talking, who ever got his own store very quickly was a guy who was uh, fresh out of the police. And he was a douche. He was a giant douche. And uh, yeah, I don't think he lasted very long. Um, anyway. On my first morning in my new store, I walked in and generally shook hands and patted babies for the first few days. I absolutely loved it and sold a lot of stock to boot. I had a really good customer base and they all wanted to support me and my new venture of running this store. This hobby nightmare though takes place on the first Friday of my first week running my own store. All of this happened in sequence throughout the day. So let's get on with it shall we? The day started in an, in an inauspicious way with all of my trains being cancelled, so me turning up to the store an hour late, with a lot of pissed off wargamers outside, because it was currently school half-term holidays. Oh my god, I, I had to do that a few times, because the trains around me, dude, were awful. So I had to do that a few times, when you turn up late and like, what time do you call this? And you're like, mate, step off, will you? You know what I mean? I then got my key broken in the lock of the door. Oh no, oh no, oh no. I had to call a locksmith to come out and open up the store for me. Cue us being two and a half hours late to starting our games and people being generally pissed off. Alright, the second part of the day came an hour or two later. When a kid, we'll call him James, headed into the store. A lovely young lad, he'd come in and paint his orcs and was never ever an issue for anybody until that day. Okay, that's cool. We are all getting our models ready for a few games on the table and I'm sorting out a, a, a few issues with another few people in the store. All is going rather quiet and I'm looking around at one wondering what to dust on my shelves next when I hear the pitter patter of water. Okay. I look up and around, thinking we may have a pipe leak, and that's just all I need right now, with my debacle with the door from earlier, my store seems to be falling apart. I then turn around and see where the water is coming from. It is dripping from the bottom of James's pants and onto the floor as he sits there, ashen-faced, trying to, trying to keep on 
painting his orcs as if nobody has noticed what he's doing. Oh no. Yep, James pissed himself. Oh no. Ugh. I told him to, to stay where he was and that I was going to call his mother. She came, was very apologetic and, and offered to clean things up. But I didn't want a member of the public cleaning up my own store, so I went I went ahead and did it myself. Good man. Good man. I mean, you know, she's already mortified as it is. James left the store in tears, and we were left with a quite awkward silence hanging around the store. I thought my day couldn't get any worse. And that's when Dickhead Salesman enters the picture. Oh, yes. A salesman came into the store a few hours later trying to sell booze to my customers. I shit you not. He had gone and stolen several bottles of wine from the local off-license, and on this Friday night had decided my store was the best place to come into to try and sell his ill-gotten goods. He was making people uncomfortable, and when I asked him to... And when I had... Sorry. When I headed over there to ask him to stop doing that or leave... He offered to step outside with me and decide wh whether he can or cannot sell his ale in my store. Oh my god, the cheeky bastard. Oh my god. Get slap in the chops for that. What do you mean step outside? Little crack addict. Bloody hell. I'll slap the crack out you, system. I shoved him towards the exit. I'm six foot three and he was a lot shorter than me. And he got the message. Good man, good man. I am not a violent man, though, so this shook me up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine so, man. I can imagine so. That's You don't need that at work. You definitely do not need that at work. At least it can't get any worse, surely. So, the worst was still to come. <laughs> you poor dude, man. This is the worst Friday ever. And you know what's even worse? In the UK, we open early on a Saturday. So the next day, you've got to be up dead early to get into the store as well. This sucks so much. So the worst was yet to come. We had this amazing gaming board in the store, built by several of the actual studio team over at Warhammer World. That's cool, man. That's cool. You're lucky hobbyists. That's cool, man. A wonderful diorama for people to play on, showing the Istvan 3 drop site massacre an amazing setting that people loved playing on and it was my pride and joy i brought it to the store with me when i took over and it was getting a lot of traction and people playing in it in the week i'd been in the store we had a guy who came into the store called steve okay a decent lad very chatty and loved his iron hands which is quite rare, so me and him got on as I love my steel boys in black. There is a game going on on the main East Van table, and I'm doing stuff under the fantasy table nearby, generally taking stock of scenery I have under the table for a board I am going to make there eventually. I look up and see Steve being a little wobbly and a little woozy, which is weird. He's a very large bloke, and so seeing him do that was tantamount to seeing a tree waving in the wind. When I look up again, Steve is now fully unconscious and falling towards the Istvan table. Oh no! It happens almost in slow motion. His fully asleep form smashing through the table and hurling two full armies across the floor. Little did I know, Steve had narcolepsy. Oh no! <laughs> For God's sake. For God's sake. Fucking sigh. <laughs> that happened at 9pm, and I decided to close the store early to clear things up. I managed to salvage the board after several weeks of painstaking work in the back room. The armies, though, were smashed to complete bits. People were pissed. But what was I to do? Yeah, it's not your fault, mate. It's not your fault. Literally, you're not on. You're not liable. Whatever happens to their models in your store at the cost of other people's actions is not your problem at all. I secretly known lost a start collecting box for each of their armies and gave them to them, which quieted the noise down quite a bit. When asked by HQ, I told them it was it was for a store project, 
and they never check these things. No, they don't. They don't. So one good thing to do if you have any sort of issue like that is no loss something from the shelves and give it to somebody. So if they if they lose a model, if they and you know they're telling the truth, right? If they lose a model, if something breaks, dude, just no loss something from the shelf and give it to them. You will get more in goodwill from from the general hobby base by making a song and dance about that than you will ever do from just you know being a nice guy. And if 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 Games Workshop HQ ask, if Nottingham ask, just tell them. Yeah, um, listen, I'm using it in a store project. They never check. They never come around and check, all right? Just make sure that your, your community is well looked after and people are doing well. Because the models are generally worthless. They're only worth anything if the people in your store pay for them. If you're accruing more people by making sure you're cultivating a good community, good on you, man. Uh, anyway, that's the, that's the tale of my horrid first Friday at Games Workshop. I literally went home and collapsed into bed after the adrenaline wore off. Thanks for all you do, North, and thanks for providing a space for us ex-staffers to get together and have a good laugh together. Cheers, Clive. Thanks, man. That was awesome. And yeah, I, I, I really, really, really am sorry about that. That's horrible. <laughs> That's absolutely horrible as first Fridays go. Um, I will speak to you all uh, tomorrow where I'm going to be doing a video with the Exalted outer circle thank you very much sir for being on that video with me and um, we're going to be doing a primark tier list which won't be controversial at all especially because you know uh outer circle knows quite a lot about uh, about horus heresy law so we're going to be getting into that tomorrow and having a really good time with it anyway i love you a long time i'll speak to you tomorrow have a good one bye now cheers <laughs>